My name is Desmond Lochman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our European event, which I'm sure is going to prove to be rather lively. Uh, it would be an understatement for me to say that over the past six months, many developments have been occurring in Europe that could have a very important bearing on both the European and the global economies. For a start, Europe has gone from growing at a satisfactory pace in 2008 in 2018, to stalling this year with a number of European economies now on the cusp of recession. In that respect, President Trump's threat to impose a 25% import tariff on European automobiles later this year has hardly been helpful. Equally troubling has been the failure of the UK Parliament to secure passage of a Brexit deal and of Nigel Farage's Brexit Party's very strong showing in the recent European elections. That raises the distinct possibility that the United Kingdom will soon get a hard Brexiter to replace Theresa May as Prime Minister, and that the UK could either crash out of Europe without a deal on October 31st, or else go to an early election. It also has to be of concern that in Italy, Mr. Salvini's political star is rising and that he is proposing a large unfunded tax cut that could put Europe, Italy on a collision course with the European Commission. Meanwhile, Europe has recently held parliamentary elections that seem to have shaken up European politics, including those in Germany, which has Europe's largest economy. That must be expected to influence the character of the next European Commission's leadership, and it could have implications for the longevity of the German government. And later this year, we have Mario Draghi's scheduled departure from heading the European Central Bank at what could prove to be an awkward time for the European economy. In short, it seemed to my good friend Alex Pollock and me very timely for us to have a European seminar that might take stock of how Europe might handle its many economic challenges. I'm delighted that we have assembled a panel of European experts, and uh, I'd emphasize the word European, that apart from me, they're uh, European, uh, with real experience to help deepen our understanding. Uh, Vita, Vitor Gaspar, who is now head of the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department, was formerly Portugal's finance minister. Athanasios Orfanidis, who teaches at MIT, was formerly the governor of the Central Bank of Cyprus and a member of the governing council of the ECB. And Lorenzo Forni, who is head of a leading Italian think tank, has had considerable experience at the IMF and the Bank of Italy. Once again, I'd emphasize that I'm neither European nor an expert, but that won't stop me from giving my opinion. Uh, with those brief words of introduction, I'll now hand it over to Alex Pollock, who will moderate this event. Thank you, Desmond. Welcome to our distinguished panel. And ladies and gentlemen, we're glad you're here uh, for our conference on Europe's populist and Brexit economic challenge. Much has been written, needless to say, about what the recent European Union parliamentary elections uh, might mean. The big question, opined one commentator, is whether the EU is gradually disintegrating or gradually progressing uh, toward a closer union. A good question for today's discussion. Another commentator suggested that the euro has proved to be a golden cage and that uh, Italy exemplifies the central problem of its monetary union. Another good issue. Desmond Lockman has asked, how likely is policy reform in the wake of the fragmentation of Europe's politics? Seems to me that such questions are about what the nature of the European Union is or will be or should be. Uh, in this context, we're always tempted to speculate about the parallels or differences with the evolution of the United States. How to structure Brexit, needless to say, is proving most difficult, uh, but exit from the European Union on any terms 
certainly contrasts vividly with Abraham Lincoln's theory that once a state was in the Union, there were no exit. Uh, there was no exit on any terms. Period. In pre-Civil War America, we had our own version of the bank government doom loop, as we now call it. In those days, American states chartered their own banks with the requirement that the banks had to buy that state's bonds to finance the state government. So the state governments and the banks could go down together, as they sometimes did, uh, just as they can in Europe today. An essential American policy decision uh, in the mid-19th century was not to bail out failing state governments. So the states of uh, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, all defaulted on their debt in the 1800s. Will the state of Illinois do so in this century? We know the Federal Reserve will buy the mortgage bonds of Fannie Mae, but it will not buy the state bonds of Illinois. On the other hand, Illinois doesn't have to ask permission of Washington, D.C. to run whatever budget deficit it wants. These two factors are interestingly reversed in the situation of Italy and the European Union. Italy is constantly tutored by Brussels about its budget, but, it, but on the other hand, it can confidently expect that the European Central Bank will support its bonds. A real interesting contrast between the evolution of these uh, two unions, it's, uh, it seems to me. What kind of union will the European Union evolve to be from where it is now? And what are the best policy recommendations for Europe now with its current political, economic, and financial stresses, as Desmond has mentioned? And we have a truly expert panel to address these issues. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Gaspar, followed by Professor or Orphanides, and then Professor Forney. Our fourth speaker, whom Desmond did not formally introduce, is Desmond himself. So I have the honor to say a few words about him. Uh, Desmond Lockman is a resident fellow at AEI, focusing on the global macroeconomy. With trademark bubbling optimism, for the results of human endeavors in politicized finance, <clears throat> Desmond frequently reminds us of our massive debt, the global asset price bubble, problems in Europe, and our voyaging in unknown financial seas. Uh, and he is the organizer of this conference. Thank you, Desmond, for getting us all together to address these most interesting and timely issues. Uh, each panelist will speak for from 13 to 15 minutes. And then we'll give the panelists a chance to react to each other or clarify uh, points as they wish. After that, we'll open the floor to your questions and we'll adjourn promptly uh, at 4 p.m. Vito, welcome to AEI, and you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I guess that my presentation will come up. Just press the push your, button. Push your forward button. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, pleasure to be here at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you, Desmond, for uh, putting this panel together and uh, for inviting me uh, to participate. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under you, Alex. <laughs> and it's a great pleasure to be here debating with my very good friends, uh, Athanasio and uh, Lorenzo. I uh, will be able to speak about Europe with uh, two advantages of perspective, I believe. I've uh, devoted 25 years of my professional career uh, to Europe. I was uh, working very closely on issues of European integration from 1989 to uh, 2014, and that's when I joined the uh, International Monetary Fund. From uh, that point onward, my view has been uh, global, and honestly, I have not been following uh, developments in uh, uh, Europe as closely as before. The other uh, advantage in terms of viewpoint is that I now see Europe from the other side of the Atlantic, and uh, distance does give perspective. Uh, I thought that this was very opportune 
because European politics are, in my view, extremely interesting. And I would like, uh, in a sense, to debate European politics with all of you, and I would like to learn more about European politics. When one thinks about the economic and financial aspects of the euro area, I think it's fair to say that from a technical viewpoint, there is an ample consensus on diagnosis, and there is an ample consensus on what kind of options make sense. The choices will be political. Just to give you a sample, the IMF has been uh, very explicit about what it uh, recommends. For example, uh, my very good colleague Paul Thompson has spoken about the architecture of uh, economic and monetary union about a year ago uh, in Brussels and used a very powerful image. He basically says that Europe should equip itself with uh, private and public mechanisms for risk sharing. He then goes on to emphasize that in order to avoid moral hazard, risk sharing has to go hand in hand with risk reduction. And then he makes a point of political realism. He says, many members, many participating countries in the euro area will not accept risk sharing without risk reduction. The elements that the IMF has been uh, putting forward as crucial for the architecture are a banking union, and progress has been made, for example, the single supervisory mechanism, but a lot remains uh, to be uh, done. For example, a European uh, deposit insurance scheme. It's very important for uh, private risk sharing, that a true capital markets union uh, is in place. There are uh, challenges that have to do with the functioning of the single market in the uh, financial sphere. There are issues that have to do with market infrastructure. There are even issues about tax harmonization. Last but not least, from a macroeconomic management viewpoint, it would be good if uh, Europe could uh, dispose of a central fiscal capacity to be able to cope with euro area wide uh, shocks or support uh, countries in the case of uh, idiosyncratic shocks. But all of this is well known. Options are on the table, choices are political, which basically means that I will use the remainder of my time speaking about politics. Now, uh, I thought that the uh, survey done by the European Council of Foreign Relations about attitudes of Europeans towards their own government at the national level, and the European government was very telling. Of all the people polled, only 24% believed that the political system worked well, both at the national and at European level. That's what you have in the top a left-hand side box. And you see that only the Danes believe so with an absolute majority, <laughs> but you have relative majorities, for example, in uh, Germany as well. Then you go to the bottom right-hand side, and you have that 38% of uh, Europeans do not uh, believe that the political system works well, either at the national or at the European uh, level. And you see that the numbers are very high uh, in countries like, say, uh, Greece or uh, Italy. So th there is clearly a challenge. Interestingly enough, and perhaps even paradoxically, most Europeans are of the view that their country benefits from membership in the European Union. 
not only is the balance of the opinion favorable to EU membership, the degree of positive balance has gone up in almost uh, all countries. Below the 45 degree line, we see uh, the Czech Republic and uh, Greece. And in terms of uh, balance of opinion, the only country that is below the 50% uh, line happens to be Italy that you see at the bottom on the left hand side. Now, this is, to me at least, truly interesting. I should have said uh, that this uh, presentation has been prepared by David Amaglobelli, and I'm just David's spokesperson. So if you want to see if my delivery is good or not, you look at David. If he looks very nervous, it means that I failed my cue. OK, but so what you see on the left-hand side is that both the participation of voters, both in national parliamentary elections and European parliamentary elections, is trending down. It's actually trending down, or has been trading down, uh, more for European elections than for national parliamentary elections. But the last European parliamentary election is an exception. There was a, quite a substantial increase in voter uh, participation, and that is uh, something which is remarkable. When David and I were discussing this, participa this participation, this presentation, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we had our views on record before the elections so that we would not be, in a sense, re-engineer uh, an explanation. And so what you have on the right-hand side is two things. One, the share of the two largest political families in Europe in the seats in the European Parliament. So that's in blue. The two largest political families in Europe are the European People's Party, EPP, and the Socialists. So typically, they dominated, they used to dominate the European Parliament. They had a very large majority together. And in this latest elections, they have come below 50% of uh, members of Parliament. At the same time, during this period, the representation of populist parties has increased. We just took a definition of populism from uh, the literature. It's from two professors from Harvard, Norris and Hingelhard, and we applied it mechanically. We just wanted to have something that would give us a view. And what you see on the left-hand side of the panel is that the populists are almost as numerous in terms of European parliamentarians as the largest uh, political families in Europe. And you see something else. The prediction from Politico and the outturn are virtually identical from a qualitative viewpoint. Remember, we're interested in the time trends, not so much whether the columns are exactly the same height or not. OK? Now. Uh, I should have told you that uh, on the previous slide, I can, I believe, go back. Yes. Uh, what you have in the European Parliament is that you have much more fragmentation than before. So at this point in time, most political analysts believe that one needs a coalition with four groups of parties to have a decisive majority that is actually able to get things done, that is much harder to find than a coalition of two. Uh, you have this increase uh, in the uh, populists, and you do have an increase in some uh, new political formations, like uh, En Marche uh, in France. And the Greens have uh, performed very well across, across Europe. I speak of political tsunamis because in many countries, political systems have been changing in a fundamental way. What you see in France, if you compare the two European Parliament elections, is that the Socialist Party has lost about half of its members of Parliament. La République en Marche 
has started as a new party and it's at the top of the representation, the Rassemblement National, National Rally, has uh, won both the European elections in 2014 and the European elections in 2019 in uh, France. But if we go to the detail, La République En Marche started extremely strong, but the showing in the European elections is substantially lower than their uh, showing in the national parliamentary elections. I, I could give you the example of the rise and fall of the socialists in Italy. I could uh, speak about the change in the um, uh, Greek uh, political system. Many examples could be given across Europe. Uh, Germany has, in Europe, been at the center of Europe uh, geographically and politically since the start of uh, the uh, European Union. The strength in terms of population, in terms of economy, in terms of finance of Germany puts it squarely at the heart of Europe. The polar opposite of uh, uh, Germany at this point in time is, to my mind, uh, Italy. And what do we see in terms of populism in Germany and Italy? When you compare 2014 and 2019, the map of Germany looks very much the same, and populism is concentrated in the eastern landers, in the eastern part of uh, Germany, while Italy, well, Italy, uh, Italy has become populist. We have uh, one exception up there in the north. Is this a coincidence? Well, not really. Uh, what we see is that there is quite a sharp contrast between the economic performance measured in terms of GDP per capita for uh, Germany and for Italy. We have there the United States and Japan for comparison. Uh, I'm <laughs> depicting GDP per capita in purchasing power parity in percentage of the average of advanced economies. So the, the lines are very uh, flat. But there is very interesting um, research by Luigi Guizzo and some co-authors that is going to come out as a Brooking paper very soon. And they show that the support for populism in uh, Western Europe is strongly correlated with exposure to the shock of globalization. And Italy is at the top of the distribution and constraints on macroeconomic <coughs> policies associated with uh, euro area uh, participation. And again, uh, Italy scores very highly. How does this leave us? Well, Jean Monnet has uh, written in his memoirs and is reproducing a very well-known speech that he gave that Europe will be built in crisis and the way the institutional structure of Europe will look like will be the sum of the responses to this crisis. Now, if you see it from that viewpoint, with so many uh, crises in the recent past, which I forgot to list, but I do have a list of them, uh, they're not only economic and financial. Migration, terrorism do qualify from a political viewpoint. They're actually uh, more salient. With all this crisis, there is ample material for building. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Athanasios. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, Vidor, it's a, it's a tough act to follow, especially the comment that we've had uh, so many crises that uh, if we were to follow uh, uh, Monet's uh, sayings, there is so much building material to move forward. And this is such a positive view of where we are headed that uh, I don't know, I'm a little bit ambivalent about taking the other side, but I will. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
I, I worry about the, the political uh, situation in, in, in Europe that, that Vidor already mentioned. Uh, and in, in my view, Europe is trapped between uh, two competing narratives uh, right now. Uh, on one hand, we have a, a technocratic elite that maintains uh, the narrative that the European project has been a huge success. The abysmal uh, economic performance of the past decade, Vidor showed uh, uh, just Italy, but uh, actually uh, with the exception of Germany, uh, the euro area has, has performed abysmally in the, uh, in the past uh, decade, is considered to be a temporary uh, aberration. Indeed, in this narrative, uh, the, uh, the only problem is uh, populist uh, indiscipline. And in some member states uh, of Europe, especially in the euro area, uh, the population is misguided. It votes for governments that uh, are no good. And then the job of the elites in Brussels and Frankfurt is to see how they can engineer kicking them out, replace them with better governments, uh, uh, that are going to move uh, the project uh, uh, ahead. And given the uh, uh, supposed benevolence of the technocrats in, in, in Brussels and Frankfurt, we should all support this, and eventually through the crisis, we are going to see uh, better days. Um, there is another narrative, uh, on, the, on the other hand, that uh, a growing fraction of the population in a growing number of countries, as was shown by the polls uh, and, uh, and the so-called uh, increase in populism that Vidor showed, uh, that recognize that the prescriptions advocated by the technocratic uh, elites in Brussels and Frankfurt don't seem to be serving uh, the needs of the people in these member states. Uh, in this alternative narrative, the elites in Brussels and Frankfurt don't appear to be acting in the best interest of Europe as a whole. They appear to be acting as if they were more or less captured by you know, a couple of member states. So their, their prescriptions are just perfect for one or two member states, but not for the rest. And we think growing appreciation that uh, this is not a club of equals. Uh, this is a club in which some member states uh, are, are at a huge disadvantage. Uh, according to these narratives, uh, they need to kick out the uh, parties that used to be the mainstream parties of the, uh, of the past. They need to elect governments that will truly represent the interests uh, of the citizens uh, of their countries even though those governments may be called populists by, uh, by foreigners and may be disliked by the elites in, in Brussels and Frankfurt. And, and it's a gamble. Uh, should you vote for a government that uh, with some probability will at least uh, protect the interests uh, of, uh, of the population in the country, even though they may create problems and frictions with, uh, with Brussels and, uh, and Frankfurt. And this is the other narrative that, that we see uh, in part in the polling data. Now, there is an advantage in Europeans looking at Europe from this side of the Atlantic, as, as, Vero, as Vidor pointed out. Uh, I think it gives us a little bit more clarity and we can dis disassociate with, with ourselves with, uh, with any of the multiple narratives that are there. I've highlighted two. Now, in my view, there is uh, uh, there is an element of truth in both of these narratives. Uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, which uh, may be better or worse, but there is a dichotomy in that the people representing these, these two views don't seem to be indirectly talking uh, with each other. Uh, and in my view, this is creating uh, tensions and is leading to uh, the risk of the disintegration of the European uh, project. And I'm not optimistic, um, and I'm not nearly as optimistic as, uh, as Vitor uh, is, uh, is this on this point. So Alex asked one of the key questions uh, uh, that in my view is, uh, is behind the current troubles. Um, has the euro proven to be a golden cage? Uh, I think this is a critical question because in in my view, many of the multiple crises that we have seen uh, over the past uh, decade, including the migration crisis and Brexit, 
originate uh, in the uh, mismanagement of the, uh, of the euro crisis. Once uh, people in different member states in the euro area saw that the rules were not enforced the same way for all member states, um, policy in Brussels and Frankfurt is not designed to uh, benefit all states uh, in, uh, in, uh, in an equal uh, manner uh, with respect to the euro area, they started asking questions about other policies. And once we realized that Europe isn't really working the way it was advertised as uh, equal states with institutions working in the interest of all, people are suspicious of uh, the response to any other problem, uh, the migration problem, and of course, uh, the British being rational people, as a people, they are rational. They say, do we really want to be in this club? Uh, that is so dysfunctional in so many other, other, other ways that is giving us the, uh, uh, the Brexit. So in my view, if we want to, um, to have any hope of moving forward, um, we need to go back and, uh, and, and ask the question, are the elites in Brussels and Frankfurt who are in effect driving the agenda, those are the the groups of people who are supposed to drive Europe forward through crisis uh, in, the, uh, in the framework that, uh, that Vera mentioned before, um, are they even acknowledging the problem? Or are we still in this situation uh, uh, of an alcoholic who, uh, who, who years after being an alcoholic still refuses to acknowledge uh, the problem? And my, my concern with Europe today is that when it comes to the main institutions in, uh, in Europe, in Brussels and in Frankfurt, uh, we are still unfortunately in the denial phase of the, uh, of the problem. And I worry quite a bit about this, because one of the questions we, uh, uh, we were asked uh, to ponder about uh, is, uh, well, suppose we, uh, we have another downturn uh, uh, in Europe. Some, some economic shock, Desmond mentioned trade, for example, we could easily see small shocks in the global economy that requires, uh, for once, uh, the correct response uh, to sustain the euro area economy. Uh, drawing from the lessons of the past 10 years, can we hope that we will have uh, the reasonable response that would be uh, necessary to uh, uh, avoid having yet another decade of, uh, of recession. And I worry quite a bit about, uh, about whether we would have the correct response uh, in, in Europe because uh, the elites in Europe have not yet acknowledged what has gone wrong over the past 10, uh, 10 years. And if one is refusing to acknowledge uh, the flaws uh, in the uh, manage management of the euro crisis, Simple things, uh, for example, that uh, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis uh, in Europe, fiscal policy ended up being too tight. Uh, I think in retrospect, from this side of the Atlantic, this is obvious. In Europe, this is still incredibly difficult to, uh, uh, to, uh, to acknowledge. Uh, or again, looking at, 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 at the euro area from this side of the Atlantic, monetary policy has been too tight. This would, be, this would seem obvious from this side of the Atlantic. Uh, the ECB before the crisis started with inflation and inflation expectations very nicely anchored around uh, just below 2%. Uh, the last five, six years, uh, the ECB has been driving core inflation in the euro area to just 1%. Uh, and uh, a few months ago, stopped uh, expansionary policies despite the fact that uh, it's nowhere close to its, to its objective. So again, I look at this flawed policies over the past uh, uh, 10 years, and, and I wonder what probability would they give that we would have reasonable policies going forward if we still have not acknowledged the problems of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the recent uh, past. And let me say a word about Italy, uh, since I have uh, four more minutes. Uh, is uh, just enough for a word about, about Italy. I believe every single speaker so far has mentioned Italy, and I expect uh, Lorenzo will mention Italy as well, so I might, I might as well. And, and, and in, in my view, 
the fact that the euro has been a disaster is something that should be acknowledged and Italy is the perfect example to make the case. Italy is a rich country that in my view should not have had uh, the problems it has right now uh, with its debt being considered almost junk effectively even though it's a rich country with a government that it's not perfect, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. But it's a government that uh, has been running primary surpluses year in, year out for the past 20 years. So if we're in an environment where the global safe interest rate is effectively 0%, how can a government that has been running for 20 years primary surpluses be considered uh, as a government uh, that, uh, that is facing uh, uh, debt trouble. What's causing that? I give this to you as an example. Now, Vitor in his charts showed Japan as another example. Of course, we all know if you're looking at a country that should have been considered somewhat more risky in terms of its fiscal policy, that should have been Japan uh, with a uh, debt to GDP ratio over 200% and the country that has been running uh, primary deficits uh, consistently for the past uh, several years. They have improved policy quite a bit. Now their primary deficit is down to about minus 3% as opposed to minus 8%, if I recall, a few years ago. But again, compare this with Italy, a country that has been running surpluses all the time. Why is Italy a, uh, a risky country and why is Italy facing this, these troubles? And as Alex pointed out, constantly being, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, let's say encouraged by the technocrats in Brussels and, 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 and Frankfurt uh, to, uh, to correct its, its ways and adopt further austerity, uh, even though uh, austerity is the last thing uh, the Italian economy needs. Uh, uh, if one looks at, uh, at uh, at subpar aggregate and demand uh, and, uh, and inflation rates, core inflation in Italy, just to give you an idea, core inflation has been running at below 1% for, sub for several years, which by any measure of macroeconomic management, if near 2% is, uh, is your price stability objective, uh, is, uh, is evidence of inadequate, massively inadequate uh, aggregate uh, uh, demand. So what's going on? Well, this is an example showing us again the mismanagement of the euro crisis and the fact that uh, policies in Europe are not designed in the benefit of Europe at all. The only reason uh, Italy's debt is considered risky as opposed to Japan's debt today is because uh, uh, Italy doesn't really have uh, a central bank that represents uh, uh, its interest. Uh, if, uh, if the Bank of Japan was... Uh, was um, dealing with, uh, with the Japanese government the same way that, uh, that the ECB is dealing with, uh, with uh, the Italian government, uh, then uh, I fear that uh, Japanese debt uh, would not be considered safe and it would not be trading at negative uh, interest rates uh, uh, today. Had the ECB been acting uh, in the best interest of the euro area as a whole, and had the ECB been operating with procedures that would be equitable for all member states of the euro area, Italy being a rich country that had been running primary surpluses uh, for all these years would not have been in trouble and Italian debt would have been considered safe and then debt to GDP ratio in Italy would have been declining consistently over the past several years. This is just an illustration uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the problems we are we are facing, I'm not going to go more into that. What I'm going to point out is that if we want to hope for uh, improvement uh, in Europe, and if we want to hope that the disintegration uh, can be avoided, and that the path highlighted by uh, by Vitor, uh, following the footsteps and the vision of uh, of Monet, will be followed, we need to have European institutions that actually start behaving the way uh, Monet would have expected them to behave. If they continue to behave the way they have been behaving in the past decade and denying obvious flaws, then I don't think we have much reason to be optimistic.
Thank you. Lorenzo. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thanks, Desmond, for organizing this and Alex for sharing. Thanks for having me. So I've decided to, um, since I work in Italy and since Italy has been mentioned many times, to focus my initial remarks on Italy. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me, before I go with my presentation and show you, you know, some numbers and some technical issues, let me tell you first, while you know, um, Athanasius and Vitor were talking, I was thinking, why Italy joined the Euro? I mean, because at the end of the day, you want to go back and, and understand uh, you know, the past to understand uh, the future. And Italy joined the euro because in the 80s, uh, basically public finance were out of control, public debt uh, basically doubled over about 15 years, uh, inflation was very high. Uh, the Bank of Italy was unable really to uh, rain on inflation because uh, the fiscal dominance basically. And uh, uh, all this process, at the time, Italy had full independent monetary policy, full independent fiscal policy. But apparently, it was not able really to manage uh, those policies the way, you know, uh, that would benefit the country fully uh, for a number of reasons um, that I'm not going to, you know, uh, I mean, it would take some time to discuss. But basically, uh, the idea was that, um, you know, uh, joining the monetary union, uh, basically the uh, central bank could recover its credibility, uh, uh, could uh, overcome uh, the problem of dynamic, what we know as economists, dynamic inconsistency. Uh, fiscal rules were seen as a way of you know, reigning into uh, the public dynamics. So that's the reason why after the 92 uh, exchange rate, let's call it crisis in Italy, um, the, the elite, the political elite, the economic elite, decided that for the country would have been good uh, to join the euro. Now, the point, so that's the, the background. The point that I'm gonna make in, in my presentation is that actually, when you look at Italy in the euro in the last 20 years, um, you, you cannot take averages. You know, uh, of course the performance has not been great for a number of reasons, but averages mask the fact that Italy under, went through two very hard crises for the country. Uh, especially the sovereign debt crisis, Italy was at the epicenter of the crisis and has been particularly dam dam damaging for the country. And, and, and I'll show you a couple of figures. And, and of course, part of the reason why the politics in Italy developed the way it did is because uh, the severity of those, of those crises. But part of the reason of the severity, of course, was related to uh, the lack of completion in the Eurera governance and issues related to the Eurera governance. But since, you know, the whatever it takes, since, you know, 2013, things have started to, to go better. And actually, Italy has, um, was able to strengthen its position. And I'll show you some data, even within the euro area. Now, the question is how to move forward, and that's definitely an issue. So let me go through quickly uh, my presentation. Um, I had a couple of slides on politics. I think I'm going to skip those slides. I'm sorry, because that's going to take a little bit of time and we'll come back to politics. So currently growth, you'll see on the left panel, is really pretty poor. Um, you know, in May, actually the 1st of June of last year, the new government, um, you know, entered into force uh, with some um, plans that were perceived as uh, at least, uh, at, the, at the least, unclear regarding how to stabilize and reduce the public debt. And then there was, you know, the international uh, economic situation that was rather weak. So after, you know, 17, there was a pretty good, these are quarter on quarter data on the, le on, on the left. After 2017, there was a pretty good year. Uh, you see the, the, the sharp slowdown already in the first part of, of 18. And uh, in, in uh, the first quarter of 19, uh, a, a pretty, uh, you know, we basically, Italy basically avoided the recession, uh, um, a, a plus 0 
positive growth and the other bars that you see in gray are our projection at Prometheia. And you see basically at this point Italy is uh, stagnating. Uh, so for 2019 probably uh, around zero or zero plus something growth. And you see on the right hand side that the same pattern right of business and consumer confidence, you know, being high in 2017, then slowing down in 18, and more or less stabilizing uh, right now. Now, um, of course, um, Desmond uh, and Alex asked, you know, a couple of questions, you know, why Italy's performance has been so poor, has to do with the euro. Uh, I'm not going, you know, to answer, uh, have a full answer to this question. It's a very complicated um, question. I'm, I, I'll just offer um, a few points. Uh, first of all, the, the productive structure uh, of Italy when it joined the Euro in 98 was not really ready for globalization. We know that, for example, China joined the WTO in 2001. There was a huge uh, change in, in trade patterns. Italian firms were small. They are still small. Family owned. Uh, you know, with limited IT uh, capacity. So, I mean, if you really, as I said, these are just a, f a few points, um, but the weakness of the productive structure uh, really uh, was already there before the euro. Then, of course, there are even uh, other issues like the north-south divide that Italy was never able really to address, uh, population, aging, population aging, which is a totally independent from the euro, uh, the brain drain is another issue. And but one point I, I'm going to make is that uh, export has done have done pretty well, even you know within the euro in the last few years. So that's something um, um, I'm going to stress. Now, this is one of the points I wanted to make. So uh, if you see, this is per capita GDP. The grid line is Italy, starting from '96 up to uh, 90, the end of, of uh, 2018. And you see that indeed the green line is not doing very well, right? Um, Italy suffered very much from the 2008-2009 crisis. You see the first arrow. And then it suffered again very much from the 2012-2011-2012 uh, uh, sovereign debt crisis. And that's the other, the second uh, green arrow. And then you see how the recovery is there, but has been rather weak. Now, <coughs> sorry. Now, on the right-hand side, you see the household saving. This is just one of the indicators I've picked to show how painful uh, these two recessions have been. You know, a saving rate that was around 8% before 2008 dropped very much uh, during the 2009 crisis and, and furthermore uh, during the 2011-2012 crisis. It recovered a little, but not as much. And uh, uh, so you can tell that these two crises have really shifted, for example, uh, the saving rate, um, at least uh, so far in Italy. So two very big crises that we can discuss why for Italy were worse than for other countries, but they have affected, you know, averages very much. Now, but notwithstanding these two crises, um, Italy was able to... Um, uh, strengthen uh, at least in a two very important position. One is this external position that in a currency union is very important. The external position, um, the current account, you see the orange line, this is percent of GDP and you read it on the right hand side, moved from a deficit of about three to four percent in 2009 to a surplus of about 2.5 percent in 2018 and the net international investor position is almost close to zero. And this position includes also the famous target two uh, debt. Uh, so, um, you know, when you think, you know, the old currency crisis, the first thing you would look at, how is the net investment position, how is the current account balance? Um, so within the euro area, Italy in the last few years was able to, uh, to, to reach uh, an external balance, which is, uh, um, uh, very important. And on the right hand side, I'm showing export to GDP just to, to point to the fact that actually, uh, you know, German has been uh, um, out of the pack in terms of the ability it had to increase the share of export to GDP. 
And, uh, uh, but Italy, more or less, uh, has been following um, the same path of Spain and France. Now, another very important uh, point that actually shows you how tough the two recessions were, but how after you know, 2014, 15, Italy was able to recover, is the, you know, the, bad debt, the bad debt with banks. So you see on the left panel, you know, the huge increase from 2009 to about 2015 of uh, non-performing loans uh, as a share of total loans up to you know, about 11%. And the extraordinary uh, reduction in the last few years, this has been you know, achieved in, in a few years where growth was not, was not great. On the right hand side, you see uh, the flow of new bad loans um, and you see this for household firms and for the total economy and you see how this uh, in the last few years has been uh, following very much. So basically, you know, after these two crises, Italy was able to, to improve in a number of dimensions. Now, of course, the public debt remains the big issue. And on the left hand side, and the, uh, the big weakness, on the left hand side you see ratings and you see rating after, you know, basically 2002 onward, and now they are, you know, they have been falling a lot around the triple B uh, level. And on the, on the right hand uh, panel, you see uh, in billion of euros, how um, is the holding of sovereign bonds by banks. And Italy is the blue line on, on the top. And even recently, you know, has, has not been uh, those amounts have not been decreasing. And on, in the other lines, you see other countries. So definitely there is an issue here. And part of the problem um, is that, I mean, of the problem is, I'm not sure that's a problem, but if you see on the left-hand side, you see holders of sovereign bonds. And the green part is foreign holders, while the blue part is domestic holders. And the yellow is the ECB, I think, or the, the QE, let's say. You see still foreign holders are about, you know, they hold still about 30% uh, of uh, Italian debt. And this has been driving a lot the spread. On the right hand side, um, we correlate, uh, you know, foreign buying and selling. So the negative, when you see a blue bar on the negative side is, is selling of Italian government bonds from no residents. And the red line is the inverted spread. So when the red line goes down, the spreads increases. And you see lately the strong correlation between the selling of non-residents with you know, the increase in the spread. So definitely here we have you know, on, on, on the debt and the debt that is being held by the banks and you know, the foreign investors, there we have issues uh, going on. Now, the last point I want to make, because I think also my time is going over, is that it, given current situation, uh, my sense is that it would not take much for Italy to, I wouldn't say thrive, I put thrive, you know, quote unquote, because thrive is a big word, uh, but to, um, you know, move forward within the euro area. And, and, and this pillar basically has to do with uh, um, committing to uh, a fiscal adjustment strategy, which uh, uh, you might call austerity. Uh, but indeed, uh, this strategy uh, should have basically three points. The first, a debt target, which you know, for illustrative purposes, I put at 9% of GDP, okay? The second is a plan of structural reforms, because Italy really in the last years didn't push much on structural reforms, you know, spending review, tax evasion, reducing the tax wedge on labor, all things that the government is not really uh, bringing forward. And I think this plan of structural reform has to be agreed with the European Union and has to um, allow some leeway in the fiscal accounts, okay? And uh, the third, of course, and partly, you know, part of this plan has to, to include some reform at the euro area level, some increase in risk sharing that would you know, make the whole thing more credible. I mentioned down um, safe assets or the European deposit insurance scheme, or even you know, increase uh, you know, in European labor mobility, because there are a lot of issues related to labor mobility in Europe uh, in terms of regulation and, and, and other issues that should be tackled and, sh and could increase a lot 
you know, the welfare of European workers. Now, um, I'm not going to get too much into the details well, of that, so, but I, I can provide you, um, you details um, that this would really allow, on the reasonable assumption, a steady decrease in the public debt. We have done simulation. I'm not, I'm not going to discuss this simulation. But of course, the issue is that currently Italy has spread between 20, uh, 250 and, 30, and, and 300 basis points. There must be a way to reduce that spread, and there must be a way um, within the euro area to do that. And I'll stop here, although I have some more points, but I, I'll make them uh, afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thanks. you'll have more chance as the discussion Thanks. proceeds. Thanks, Thanks Lorenzo. Thanks. Desmond. Thank you, Alex. Um, coming last is always difficult because a lot of stuff that has been said, uh, you know, I very much agree with. Uh, but I'd put it in somewhat of a different perspective. Uh, and uh, I'd say that I'm rather pessimistic about what Europe's uh, future looks like. And uh, what I want to discuss is uh, four reasons for my pessimism. The first that you know, we've touched on quite a lot uh, has been the history of the last 10, 15 years that Europe has really been performing in a rather disappointing way, both from an economic point of view and from a political point of view. And I don't see much reason why that is going to change. Uh, the second point that I'm going to make is that Europe suffers from uh, fundamental flaws in the euro uh, that raise real existential questions. Those, I don't think, are going to go away either. Uh, the third point I want to make is that uh, Europe is now confronted with potentially major challenges in two very large countries. You know, the one is the United Kingdom, the other is uh, Italy. And the reasons to think that Germany could be hit by shocks that will make this whole configuration rather uh, difficult. And the last point that I'll be making is that Europe has very limited possibility uh, to react to a crisis, that the amount of policy maneuverability that they've got, both on the fiscal and the monetary side uh, is rather limited uh, for reasons that I'll get into. So just to go uh, very uh, quickly uh, through the history is uh, that uh, European uh, performance, economic performance has been pretty dismal, uh, not in the sense that Germany hasn't done reasonably well. Germany's done pretty much as well as the United States after the 2008 crisis, but it's more the countries in the south, and particularly in Italy. So, you know, go back to uh, this chart. You know, it's amazing that over uh, a period, you know, 20 years since the euro began, uh, Italy's per capita income today is lower than it was 20 years ago. That's not a healthy situation, whereas Germany's is something like 20, 25% higher. So the gap that you've got between the two is really creating a lot of divergence on the economic side, and that leads to uh, political uh, difficulties that we've talked about. Uh, of course, the same thing you see on the unemployment side, that you know, if you look at uh, where we began in 2007, 2008, uh, all of these countries seem to have similar rates of unemployment. Uh, today, you know, what we've got is Germany's got a rate of unemployment well below five, uh, and Italy is still well above 10. You know, that's not a healthy situation. So a currency union that was supposed to bring about uh, convergence and prosperity for all, you know, seems to me to have created divergence. You know, you've got very strong resentment between the North and the South. Uh, the South, you know, feels that austerity is foist on them, uh, that Brussels isn't uh, responsive you know, to their needs, uh, and the North uh, is getting tired of having to bail out countries that they don't believe uh, play by uh, the rules. Uh, 
And what uh, Vitor said now is that it looks like the center in European politics isn't holding. You know, you're getting a lot of fragmentation. And I would just say that in the recent European parliamentary uh, election result, uh, you know, while it wasn't as bad as people expect, in fact, it was better in some respects on average, uh, three countries that really counted, uh, really the result was rather alarming. Uh, thinking of uh, Nigel Farage in uh, uh, the United Kingdom, you know, totally decimating the Tory party, you know, totally shaking up British politics, determining where Brexit is headed. Uh, in Italy, you have Salvini, uh, who's now got the bit between his teeth, the supposed Judeo member in the coalition, who's now the senior member, and he'll be driving economic policy going forward. And he's got certain strange ideas about how to deal with Italy's crisis. Uh, and then Germany, you know, the center uh, collapses, that you've got Mrs. Merkel's coalition now looks in trouble. Uh, and that might be problematic if Europe gets into uh, a crisis. So bad politics also makes uh, reform uh, difficult. So, so much for the history, you know, and I think that the past could be a prologue to the future, uh, you know, which doesn't lead me to be too optimistic. Uh, the more important point that I want to make is uh, that the euro is fundamentally flawed. And how I think it's flawed is that one should never have had two countries in a currency union that have got totally different productivity performances, differences in terms of how to structurally reform their economy. And what I'm thinking of is uh, Italy and, um, and Germany. You know that, so what you see is uh, this chart is just showing uh, unit labor costs in the different countries. So if you take a look at Italy, the red line, Italy is some 30% above, it's lost 30% of competitiveness to the uh, other countries in Europe. That is something that uh, I don't see any reason why that is going to change going forward. You know, in fact, it gets worse. And that, to me, underlies uh, the very weak performance of uh, Italy uh, relative to a more competitive country uh, like Germany. The other weaknesses in the Europe where it's fundamentally flawed is what Vitor mentioned, that uh, the union is not complete, that it's missing key elements, you know, a fiscal union, a proper insurance mechanism, risk sharing, and all the rest. And the fact that you haven't had it for 20 years, and now you've got worse politics, uh, I don't, I'm not holding my breath to, for this to happen going forward. Uh, the other thing that I think is a flaw in the euro is that you've got a country that is at the center of the system uh, that totally believes in balancing its budget under all circumstances. And in fact, there's a uh, constitutional amendment that requires them to have a structural balance in their uh, accounts. So it means that you have a uh, government uh, that Germany is limited in what it does in terms of downturns. You know, so you really need them to uh, uh, expand in the downturn, to use their fiscal space to get things going. Germany insists on doing that. I mean, it causes other problems with the United States. That is the counterpart of Germany running a very big current account surplus, uh, you know, which can lead to uh, import tariffs coming on Germany uh, later on. So uh, those are fundamental flaws that uh, I think uh, make it difficult to see how things correct. Let me go to the third uh, point that I want to make uh, and just say that uh, there really are major challenges for uh, Europe going forward. You know, the first, uh, you know, and I think that that is the most dangerous challenge uh, going forward is Italy. And uh, it's a question that Italy really now has the highest debt level to GDP than it has uh, in the past 150 years. So they don't really have much room. If the Italian economy, for any reason, goes into recession and they can't get out of recession, their whole debt uh, situation really becomes uh, very problematic. 
Italy has been enjoying a period in which the ECB has been buying its bonds, in which global liquidity conditions were really terrific. As soon as that changes, you're then going to get the spreads widening that Lorenzo mentioned, and then Italy gets into very bad uh, debt dynamics. The other thing is, uh, we've already had that chart, you know, Alex mentioned the doom loop. Uh, Italy doesn't only have very high debt, but it's got a government that, uh, it's, so I say it's got a banking system that is holding something like 10% of its assets in terms of uh, Italian government bonds. So as those spreads go up, the capital of those banks get eroded. Those banks can't lend. You know, it just adds to that negative uh, debt loop in which uh, Italy uh, finds itself. So Italy, I'll just remind you, is the third largest member of the Eurozone. It's the country that has got the third largest sovereign bond market in the world. So we're talking about $2.5 trillion of bonds. If things go wrong in Italy, that is not good news for either the European economy or for uh, the global economy. Uh, and uh, what uh, gives me pause right now is that as Italy is slowing, uh, Salvini is talking about needing to give Italy a fiscal shock. You know, why don't we just go to a flat tax cut? Why don't we do what President Trump did in the United States? Never mind the high debt. Never mind that the debt dynamics is bad. Never mind that foreign bondholders are already getting skittish. Uh, one, we just uh, have a fiscal stimulus here of something like one and a half points of GDP. To me, that looks like uh, you're inviting a trouble relatively soon. Uh, the other thing uh, I would want to point out is in the United Kingdom, we've got now a situation particularly with Farage having won that election, it seems to me that there are really only two possibilities in the UK right now. The one, you know, which seems to come as news to uh, people in the United Kingdom is they're not in control of whether they have a hard Brexit or they don't have a hard Brexit. If they don't agree to the deal by the deadline, the default position is they have a hard Brexit. The only way you're going to avoid that hard Brexit is if you get a delay in the... Uh, since you're going to be getting a hard Brexit, the Tories are going to have to elect a hard Brexiter to replace Theresa May. Otherwise, they're going to be completely destroyed by Nigel Farage. So with a hard Brexiter at the helm in the UK, the only way that the UK is not going to crash out of Europe is if somehow Parliament restrains them and forces a general election. But that raises the prospect that Jeremy Corbyn gets into power, which is another negative for the United Kingdom. Just in terms of the United Kingdom crashing out of Europe, most of the estimates that I see, you know, whether it's from the Bank of England, whether it's from the OECD, whether it's from the IMF, you're talking about the United Kingdom economy getting hit by a decline of anywhere between 6, 7, 8 percent of GDP over an 18-month period. We're talking about the fifth largest economy in uh, the world. That is not a, a joke, you know, particularly with what's going on with China and uh, so on. So for that reason, I'm not uh, overly optimistic about Europe. This chart is just showing that even already now, the past two and a half years since the referendum, the black line at the bottom is UK investment. Uh, the line above are the other countries in uh, Europe. You know, so what you're seeing is that investment in the UK has already flatlined uh, since uh, uh, 2000, the middle of 2016 when others are increasing. If they crash out of Europe, uh, that is really, uh, I think that the estimates, the consensus estimate, uh, is right that that'll be a huge shock to Europe. And it'll be a shock to maybe, it's not a shock to the overall European economy, uh, but certainly a country that's as precarious as Italy, the last thing that they can afford is a shock in a major country uh, that can be uh, the uh, tipping point. Uh, the question I would just say about Germany is that Germany is a highly export-dependent economy. You know, so this is really the third uh, leg. This chart is just showing you Germany's exports as a percent of GDP. 
we're talking about roughly half of their <coughs> GDP. So Germany can hardly afford to have the United States in a trade war with China that is slowing China down. That explains a lot of the slowdown in the German economy. If that gets worse, Germany is going to be really hit hard by the closure of its export markets in Asia. And then what we've got is uh, our president, in his wisdom, is thinking that it would be a good idea to put a 25% tariff on European uh, automobiles and uh, Japanese automobiles. So if he does follow through on that, uh, you know, that's another risk. So I'm seeing that there are three major risks, Italy, United Kingdom, and Germany, that doesn't give me uh, much uh, room for optimism. Uh, the last point uh, I just make is that uh, uh, in terms of policy response, you know, what we've got is we've got Germany uh, that doesn't want to use this fiscal space. Uh, so that's a problem, you know, if you have another European downturn. And it's worse than that because what uh, Germany does is it foists on the others uh, to have budget austerity, you know, to try to balance their budgets when things are going down. That deepens uh, the recession. Uh, and I needn't say that uh, European Central Bank is starting from very low interest rates. They don't have much room on the interest rate side, you know, and I'm not sure uh, that, you know, if we get uh, a German at the head of the central bank that they'll uh, have much enthusiasm uh, to further increase the size of the European uh, uh, balance sheet. So uh, that is where I stand on uh, Europe. Thank you, Desmond. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, give all the panelists, we'll just go in the same order we went before, uh, two or three minutes. Anything you want to react to anybody else or uh, add additional points of your own? And uh, Vitor, we'll start with you. Absolutely. I believe that I've been uh, named the uh, optimist in this uh, <laughs> panel. So let me make one point about policy and one point about politics, and I believe that these two points will help rebalance a little bit uh, the uh, debate in the panel. The policy uh, point, I, I want to go back to when I was working uh, in Brussels at the European Commission, for the president of the European Commission. Uh, I left in 2010, so we were at the beginning of the global financial crisis. And one of the things that we were discussing quite actively is uh, uh, how should uh, Europe react, what kind of institutional uh, changes uh, could be made. And I can assure you that at that point in time, there were very few, I don't remember any, who believe that setting up a single supervisory mechanism or setting up a European stability mechanism was uh, politically feasible. Then, the point that I illustrated with Jean Monnet, uh, quote, took hold, the crisis got bad enough and political will was mobilized and institutional change took place. It's not only the ESM, it's not only the single supervisory mechanism, but they're very strong pieces of the institutional setup and they're true progress. Uh, we have, in a sense, in the panel, agreed that the puzzle is not complete. More remains to be uh, done, but progress uh, took place. This is the policy uh, point. The political point has to do with Brexit. So 2016 was a very uh, lively political year. Around the middle of 2016, there was the Brexit referendum on the 23rd of June. And if you would go around Europe, you would see that uh, sentiments that did correlate with the sentiment that led to Brexit resonated. Some, a few months after Brexit, uh, Marine Le Pen gave an interview to Foreign Affairs where she spoke about Frexit and she spoke about negotiating with Europe and in case the negotiation would not go uh, well from the viewpoint of France, France should consider exiting the euro area and the European Union. 
one of the political facts of this European election is that the populists change their speech and they're not talking now about leaving the euro area, they're not talking about leaving the European Union, they're talking about very much in a way that resembles one of the stories that Athanasios uh, put together, changing Europe from the inside in the Salvini formulation towards common sense in order to make uh, Europe work for the European uh, people uh, and, in a sense, uh, put the elites that have been ruling uh, Europe under control. The point is that the debate is now about Europe. The attitudes about Europe have become more uh, positive. The engagement on politics at European level is much more lively. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, uh, make uh, uh, a couple of points uh, as well, motivated by, uh, by Vidor and, and, and Desmond. Uh, and I'm going to touch on uh, the euro crisis and a little bit on, uh, on Brexit. On, on the euro crisis, uh, uh, again, uh, it, in my view, it's very, very important to understand and acknowledge what the problems have been. And I think it's problematic when we try to claim that some of the changes that have occurred over the past 10 years, let me give you an example, the, the so-called banking union uh, is, is an improvement. So my reading uh, is that change has indeed occurred over the past 10 years, but in my view, Europe has not moved forward with this change. The banking union, for example, is uh, only a banking union in name. Uh, what we have created in, uh, in Europe is a framework that resembles quite a bit the uh, uh, taxation with no representation regime that we know what, that, that, what, what, what this led to in this, uh, in this particular country. What we have in, uh, in Europe right now is a situation where um, uh, technocrats uh, in, uh, uh, outside a country can decide to shut down a bank. Technocrats outside a country uh, supervise and regulate a bank, okay? But if uh, those technocrats decide to shut down the bank, it's uh, uh, the uh, uh, taxpayers of that country that have to pay the bill. And this is what I mean by taxation with no representation. So we have set up a system that is not really what uh, Anybody in this room, I think, would have called the banking union uh, if, if we wanted to set up a, a banking union in Europe. If we wanted to set, to set up a banking union in Europe, that would have been something like uh, uh, FDIC uh, in the United States uh, and Fed supervision and joint deposit insurance risk sharing. At the same time, you give away uh, to, a, to the technocrats the, uh, the authority to uh, to shut down banks uh, and impose costs on taxpayers of a country. So again, not all that has been called progress is real progress. All of it is progress in name. And I fear most of it is progress in name only. Another example along these lines, the creation of the ESM, which is a funding facility that is not a European uh, facility. It's actually an intergovernmental treaty that gives uh, major member states veto power on decisions. And this actually has been one of the reasons why people in some member states are objecting to the malfunctioning of, uh, of Europe. We could have set up good institutions. We didn't. We failed. We did not really follow up on as uh, practice. I'm going to link this to Brexit. Uh, uh, in the following way, and uh, going back to, to Alex's golden uh, age, if a club is working well um, and it's equitable in the treatment of the member states, since we are not talking about a political union, uh, I think it should be envisioned that uh, if a member state wanted to exit, then that member state should not be punished for wanting to exit. 
The current situation I see in the, uh, in the UK, uh, I consider as yet another indication of the malfunctioning of the European Union. Because officials in some other member states, primarily in member states uh, who have been benefiting from the current configuration of the balance of power in Europe, have suggested that if the UK wants to leave the EU, uh, that's okay, but it should be a term that punish the UK for wanting to leave the EU. Again, I consider to be this to be evidence of the malfunction. So when Desmond suggests that a hard Brexit uh, actually would be very dangerous for the EU, I fully agree with that. Uh, and uh, the fact that the, um, uh, the rest of the European Union has refused to negotiate a reasonable deal that would be win-win for all sides, and they have insisted on negotiating a deal that is terrible for the UK, that is really leading us to the discussion of, of a, the possibility of hard Brexit, to me is yet another indication of the malfunction of the, uh, of the EU. On the optimistic side, I have to differentiate myself slightly from Desmond. Uh, there is this one slight hope, it may not happen, but this one slight hope with, with respect to, to Brexit that since the European Court of Justice has given British authorities the option of uh, stopping the clock, stopping the Brexit process, as long as uh, either the British Parliament uh, votes to stop the clock or they call for another referendum and let the people do it. I would consider that that is another alternative that uh, I would view a more positive alternative uh, if we get to that. Uh, indeed, that's such a positive alternative that some of the other member states don't want to see that outcome. This is why we see some other member states willing to give extensions uh, in order to uh, pretty much push the UK towards a bad outcome rather than encourage what would have been a better outcome overall. Thank you. Victoria, do you want a, a minute on rejoinder, especially on banking union and stability no, mechanism? Absolutely. If you give me the, <laughs> I, could, I could feel the, if you give the me desire the there. <laughs> so I, I think that there is a categorical uh, difficulty in uh, my friend Athanasio's reasoning. The fact that you have not completed a journey does not mean that the steps that you have taken are not progress. The single supervisory mechanism and the European stability mechanism are, I believe, very important pillars of the architecture that Europe wants to engage uh, on. There are aspects that are incomplete and they're important, in particular, the financial mechanisms underpinning the, uh, the banking union. The uh, uh, taxation without representation aspect that Athanasius was talking about uh, is not even under the uh, current already reached agreements a permanent feature, is a trans transitional uh, feature of, of the system. So uh, definitely I would not uh, recognize that the single supervisor mechanism or the ESM were uh, steps in the wrong uh, direction were or were wrongly motivated. Moreover, both have already, I believe, uh, contributed to, to progress in the stabilization of the euro area. Thank you. I bet we'll come back to this in the question period. Lorenzo, yeah. uh, three or four minutes. You yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, I'm going to repeat myself. I think we want to break, you know, the pre-2012 uh, um, years with the past 2012 years because you know after the sovereign debt crisis after some of the institutional changes have been taken after and actually the ECB has substantially increased you know what we call the toolbox the, you know the QE the TLTROs and all the liquidity that has been increasing I think Europe was able to you know correct external imbalances strengthen the banking system reduce public debt in a number of countries. And Italian public debt, my assessment is that is perfectly sustainable. Of course, I mean, there are risks, but it's you know, on a, a potential output, let's say, uh, if, you, if you include potential output, long-term, in a long-term perspective, it's sustainable. So there are no major disequilibria in the euro area. 
So there, I don't see the reason why we have to think that is not sustainable. Now, of course, there are a lot of um, jobs that have to be completed and the political will to do that, sometimes we, we don't see it and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to wait another crisis. But Lorenzo, yeah. the unsustainable guy, the guy who used the word unsustainable was Dem Desmond. So yeah. you're unfairing I think the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, I agree with you. Italy is sustainable, and actually, if the ECB were doing its job correctly, debt on GDP would have been declining massively, much like your scenario, your good scenario. Right, right. But and, I don't. And Desmond is coming after you, Lorenzo. Yeah, so he, yeah, he, he, yeah. get a chance. No, what, what, uh, let me make a, a more general uh, point that maybe you know my fellow panelists will have a, will have some comment on that is that uh, sometimes I feel there is too much focus on fiscal and monetary policy. You know, long-term growth does not depend on the exchange rate, does not depend, you know, fiscal and monetary are for stabilization purposes, not, not, not for long-term growth. So we should shift from time to time the focus on, you know, what are the policies that can underpin growth in the long run. And that's, why the, that's the reason why, for example, I pointed to the importance of improving, you know, the level of market flexibility within the euro area and the European Union. And, you know, I think this is going to be much more important. Let's talk about, you know, how to increase infrastructure investment. I think those things are much more important than whether Italy, that has already extremely high debt, should do, you know, a fiscal expansion of 0 0.5, because if it does more than that, you know, investors are, is going to, are going to panic. Uh, so that's my general point. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I guess let me make just a couple of points. One on Brexit. You know, while I grant Athanasios's point that in theory it's possible that the UK can stop the clock, uh, the reality is that all of the candidates wanting to replace Theresa May are talking about the United Kingdom leaving Europe on October the 31st with or without a deal. So I don't see that that is going to be one option, that the way in which this will stop is if the government is brought down and you have a general election and then the Europeans will say that now we've got reason to give them another extension that's not just going to be a repeat because the political situation has changed. So I don't see uh, them stopping the clock. On Italy, uh, I think that a point that we really should remind ourselves is that Italy uh, is something like 10 times the size of Greece. In order to bail out Italy, that is going to take a monumental amount of money. So whether you've got an ESM in place, you know, which I think that that is an improvement, and the OMT, that's an improvement, it's going to amount to a question of whether there's willingness to bail out for the other members to expend enormous amount of money. So we might be in a situation where Italy is too big to fail but also too big to bail, that the political willingness on the other side uh, won't be there, particularly if you've got a government that isn't going to be playing by the rules, that is really saying, we wanting to go in a different direction, you know, your rules are really bad. So that is a, uh, uh, a risk. The last point I'd make is just in terms of debt dynamics. Uh, you know, I would just suggest that this is a situation where we've got good equilibria and we've got bad equilibria. If the market decides to put Italian spreads, you know, that currently the spread is roughly 250, 300 basis points, if they widen the spread for whatever reason to 400, 500 basis points, well, that is going to have a dynamic that is going to make Italy grow at a much slower rate, or should I say the economy declines, so the whole debt dynamics looks pretty bad. And we're back into that uh, situation where you really have to break that dynamic by throwing a huge amount of money. And I'm not sure uh, that there'll be the appetite at uh, this time uh, around uh, uh, to do that. Just last point is just uh, because this point really bothers me because it's raised uh, in, um, uh, in a broader context in the United States. You know, and I'm sure that uh, Vito would have something to say. Uh, by one of Athanasios's former colleagues at MIT, you know, Olivia Blanchard, seems to think that if uh, the rate of 
interest rate is below the rate of growth, you can have whatever budget deficit you have. Likewise with a primary surplus, that if Italy's got a primary surplus, but it's also got a very high debt level, it's got a very low growth rate, and people put uh, very high interest rates, that makes the debt uh, on an explosive uh, path. You know, so I think we've really got to look at this in a broader kind of way. Just the fact that Italy's got a primary surplus uh, is a necessary condition, but not nearly sufficient. The primary surplus that Italy's got is 1% when they really need a primary surplus of something like 3 or 4% to stabilize the debt and even higher uh, to bring it down. So I don't take that much comfort that Italy is running a primary surplus. Whether the, uh, let me just add, do you want to make a point? Uh, Go ahead. If, if I could, I would like to make two points on behalf of Olivier and one point on behalf of myself. The two points on behalf <laughs> of Olivier is that uh, Olivier, in his presidential address to the American Economic Association, documents empirically the fact that uh, the difference between the interest rate and the growth rate has been negative. And in that context, he makes the point that if countries run primary balances, they don't have either a surplus or a deficit, then the debt dynamics take care of themselves. He's not saying, second point on behalf of Olivier, that there is no intertemporal budget constraint. If you have a sufficiently high primary deficit, the public debt to GDP ratio will go up. And eventually, the intertemporal budget constraint will assert itself. So this is what Olivier states in his uh, lecture. And I believe that from a mathematical viewpoint, this is correct. The point which is worthwhile making on my own behalf is that although R minus G is negative in most countries, most of the time, and in the IMF forecasts, we have that for most countries, Italy is an exception. So in historical time series, R minus G is typically positive for Italy, and it is positive in our forecast as well. So you're absolutely right, Desmond. Uh, the debt dynamics in, uh, in, um, that Olivier was indicating do not apply to uh, Italy. Olivier has written an interesting policy piece on Italy where he does look at that dynamics for Italy, for the specific case, and he warns about the sensitivity of Italian public debt dynamics to market sentiment. We'll, we'll take uh, two more comments, and then we're going to give the audience a chance. Uh, who wants to go first? That's Italy. This is Italy, <laughs> Lorenzo. It's on, Italy, just, just yeah, it's, to... no, it, it's on Italy and then that dynamics as well. So you go first. Okay. And then I... So it's, you it's, go so, first. So, <laughs> because I, I, you know, it's, I, 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 I brought the point, and I agree with Lorenzo, that uh, Italian debt dynamics are sustainable, unless the ECB decides to make them unsustainable. And this is why I want to stress the configuration of, of events. I agree absolutely with what... Uh, with what Vidor mentioned on, um, uh, on, the, on the primary surplus. Of course, this is just accounting, but what I had said uh, in, uh, in my introductory remarks was that with global safe interest rates effectively at zero, um, they may not stay at zero for the next 50 years, but they have been at zero and they are projected to be extremely low for the next many years. If the ECB was doing its job and was not injecting unnecessary spreads in Italian debt, then the Italian government bond yields would have been closer to Japan's government bond yields rather than the current yields. And with those yields, then debt to GDP ratio in Italy would have already been declining massively, even though uh, growth is lower in Italy than in other countries. So you would not, it would not have been declining as massively as in German uh, 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 debt to GDP uh, ratio, but it would have been declining. So it's a combination of factors. The reason why the Italian debt dynamics right now do not match uh, uh, those of other countries is because of the way the ECB is doing its policies. Going back to uh, 2011, for example, uh, let me remind you uh, how... Uh, uh, European institutions managed to kick uh, 
a prime minister out of power in Italy. It was with the threat that uh, uh, the uh, collateral eligibility of Italian debt uh, would disappear overnight. It was with a threat that effectively a default would be engineered. Uh, and of course, if you have institutions operating in a manner threatening to engineer uh, and default in the country, then I would not use the terminology you use, Desmond, which is that markets may become fearful and guide us to a bad equilibrium where better equilibria are available. I would say European institutions are operating in a manner that may, make market, may force markets to go to a bad equilibrium, whereas better equilibria would be available. So this is one of the key concerns I have about Europe that institutions are not working in the way either the treaty or the design of, of the European project and vision that they would work, supporting equitably all member states. And Italy is the country that caught the short stick. Lorenzo. Yeah, okay, so let me point a couple of, uh, of issues. First, Ol Ol Olivier, to... in the policy piece uh, that you mentioned, uh, Vitor, actually, argues that the, the public debt, the Italian public debt, is sustainable, just to make uh, things clear. Now, second point, it's definitely, you know, in case of a big recession, um, it's definitely an issue. I'm not, I'm not shying away from the fact that um, the uh, buffers that the current um, political, Italian political system is building up are limited in case of a recession in terms of the debt dynamic. That's, that's out of, uh, of question. Now, but I think it's up to the Italian, you know, uh, policymakers to uh, make clear what is their plan to reduce the debt because, you know, the, the current government basically has no plan and is creating a lot of uncertainty. So you can blame the ECB, but, you know, it's very difficult when uh, a government has no commitment to reduce the debt. Uh, you know, to blame someone else because it's the government itself should be the first one trying to, you know, reduce the spread and is not doing that. So um, this is basically, um, you know, the two points I want to make. The, the last point is that, you know, I'm repeating myself, but with monetary independence, Italy was not doing better. You know, you, 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 you make the parallel with the Japan, with a country, you know, that is a, has its own monetary policy. But we had that and was, we were not doing, you know, better. Uh, in, in 92, we had an exchange rate crisis and so on and so forth. So it's not that having monetary independence, think about, you know, a lot of countries in the world have monetary independence, have been running a bunch of crises, exchange rate crises, banking crises, all the time, and so it's not that monetary independence per se is, you know, uh, the solution of, uh, you know, an unsustainable debt dynamic. But Let that, me give that, that double double hand because I, I thought your chart showed that real per capita and GDP is below where it was 20 yes. years ago. Yes. I thought it had risen in the previous 20 years. Just yes, just the facts. That's right. Just the facts. Yeah, okay, but that's not a theory. That's, that's just a correlation, right? It's not a causation. Okay. Let me give uh, Desmond one, one, one minute. 15 We're, seconds? 15 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is that it's very important to understand that the European Central Bank does not have a mandate to target yields or spreads across member states. There is a principle of neutrality that in the statute it has to do with fulfilling the principle of an open market economy with free competition that constrains the way monetary policy can be designed. Thank you. So that's, uh, that would be the point that I'd be making. Is I find it strange now to be blaming the ECB for Italy's spread widening you know, because I thought that the whole architecture of the euro was that there were rules about what kind of deficits country would run, you know, the whole of the Maastricht kind of criteria. And secondly, there was a rule that was only violated in 2012 that there should be no monetary financing of the uh, country's budget deficit. So if you do get spread widening from the markets, 
I don't know what you're expecting the ECB to do. You know, should they go out there and buy I mean, uh, your response that the way in which they ran the um, the way in which they <laughs> ran their quantitative easing program was mm -hmm. when they bought bonds, they bought it according to a capital key. They didn't buy it according. They didn't have discretion as, oh, Italy's under pressure, let's get the spreads down. In fact, the market serves as a, a useful function uh, to get these guys to get their act together, you know, that the debt is getting unsustainable. I don't see how the ECB By the way, can before get rid of we, the spread. We have to, I, I'm going to have to stop us because just as Athanasio says, the ECB and the European Union has the responsibility to act for the people of Europe, I have the responsibility to act for the people uh, yeah. here, and we. But I do grant myself thirty seconds to say what I learned from an old banker at the first international debt crisis conference I was ever at in the nineteen eighties, which is the crisis occurs when the lenders stop lending. As long as the lenders keep lending, you keep going. So, from a financial point of view, it's that moment that you have to figure out. I want to thank the panelists for really excellent, interesting, and thoughtful presentations and sharp and focused discussion. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come to your questions. Let me uh, remind you, please wait uh, for the microphone to come. Uh, when it arrives, tell us your name uh, and your affiliation, and then ask your question. If you suddenly feel an urge to give a lecture, instead of asking a question, the chair will remind you to come to your, your question. I had one here, I think, and I'm going to come here, number two, and uh, you will be number three and four, and we'll see if we can fit those in, and uh, let's, let's start here. Good evening. My name is Adi. I'm from Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, two questions. One, about Italy. How to factor in the problem of corruption? The last time I was in Italy, in Reggio Calabria and Calabria, one of the biggest problems there was the problem of corruption. There was discussion to forbid the 500 euros bill to run because they'd be using by uh, corruption intent. So this one. And second, uh, about hard, a hard Brexit, uh, what is the incentive for the Europeans to give up a lot of uh, questions that the United Kingdom are asking, especially if Northern uh, Ireland, that is impossible to address what the UK wants. Okay, thank you. Two questions is, is more than you get, yeah. but we'll, 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 we'll give you two. How about corruption? Who wants to take uh, the, the question of corruption? Um, I, I can take, I mean, a first um, pass at it. It's definitely an issue. Um, uh, it's very difficult. Maybe Vitor has to add since the last fiscal monitor focused on corruption. Uh, I, I haven't seen, you know, it's very difficult to have comparative statistics with other countries because, of course, you know, you don't get official statistics on corruption. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, what concerns me is that, um, uh, you know, there are different... There are different attitudes that different governments have. And you know, when, you, when, you, when a government is elected that wants to fight corruption, let me put together also tax evasions. You know, the countries and the economic agents react to this, and we have seen this in the past. And lately, you know, it's not clear what is the position or the attitude of this current government. You know, I could mention you a number of, of bills they have passed that it's not really clear how uh, how they want to tackle, if they want to tackle corruption. And I think this might have a repercussion, for example, on tax revenues going forward and stuff like that. So it's definitely an issue. Thank you. Now, how about uh, why should Europe give up uh, its uh, uh, demands on Brexit? I, th I think this is for you. And the thesis. Well, so if, if I would uh, let me actually take, take uh, head on the issue of, of Ireland, for example. I think Ireland is a, is a very difficult issue, both for the UK, but also for Ireland. And Ireland happens to be a, a member of the European Union and a member of the Euro area. I think it, if the European Union was working on trying to solve problems for all its member states, and Ireland was considered equitable uh, as, as a member state, 
then actually uh, uh, there would be a very strong incentive to make sure that the solution regarding the border in Northern Ireland is, is very good both for the UK and for Ireland. And in, instead, uh, what I saw is that, uh, uh, and, and here I would, I would agree with those who say that, uh, that Prime Minister May really did not negotiate a good deal, uh, the UK completely gave that issue away without really getting anything in, uh, in, in return. So in my view, there was not really goodwill on the, on the, on the side of the uh, European Union to negotiate uh, a good solution. I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with that in that I, my understanding is that the whole backstop was at the request of the United Kingdom, it wasn't at the request of the uh, Europeans, you know, that they were trying to solve the problem. Europe certainly doesn't have an interest in having the UK crash out, you know, because that'll have consequences for them as well. But the Irish question is a very complicated question because as soon as the United Kingdom leaves and it's not in a customs union, you have to have a hard border. So, but in, if the deal that she negotiated was that if you now give the Europeans the decision as to whether or not the UK can leave uh, until you've sorted out the border issue, it's a very complicated uh, uh, kind of question, but I wouldn't really, on that one, I wouldn't blame uh, the European Union for having negotiated in bad faith. M my one more, and then we'll go ahead. My understanding is that the Irish border question is actually a logical question, and it's basically an internal United Kingdom issue. Why is it so? There is a Good Friday agreement that basically negotiated an absence of a border inside Ireland. And that was crucial for a political agreement inside the United Kingdom, okay? That was not a problem because that agreement was negotiated when the UK was a member of the European Union. So a border was not necessary from the viewpoint of Europe. When the UK decides to request leaving, how are you going to be able to enforce border control with Europe, but not in Ireland? How is that going to work? Where are you going to enforce the borders between the UK and the European Union? The idea is that technology, some point in the future, will solve the control automatically so that people using the border will not notice that there is control. So it's a miracle. The logical problem is solved through a technological miracle. <laughs> and the question is, in the absence of the technological miracle, how are we going to ensure something that works in today's world? And that has to be some kind of a border perhaps, as it was negotiated, followed by a period where both parties will looking, be looking at practical solutions to solve it. Thank you. May come to my second question. You're waiting for the microphone, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel DiMartino. I'm an intern at the Tax Foundation. Um, so my question is specifically for Mr. Orfanides that, you know, you basically argue that it is because of the European Union that there have been so many so much of an increase in divergence between these European countries. And even though obviously that's true because there are structural uh, productivity differences and once there's free trade between these countries, companies will move between countries and people will also do that. Don't you think that the EU cannot solve this since these structural differences are country by country and therefore it is the responsibility of those specific countries to change their uh, fiscal and regulatory policies to compete? Thank you. Yeah, so, so briefly, I would say that I agree with you that there is country, and this is something that Lorenzo pointed out as, as, uh, before, I agree that there is, there is a responsibility on each government to adopt policies that would work well for the country. However, in the euro area, the current operating procedures of the ECB and the combination of the I keep using this word recommendation. I think budgeting was the, uh, the alternative uh, that was used. And flawed policies by the ECB that seem to be favoring countercyclical uh, 
um, uh, action for some member states, but not in others, have contributed to the divergence. So if I look at, say, for example, Germany and Italy, this was pointed out, I look at the last bullet in Desmond's point was uh, there is strong resistance in Germany to more ECB quantitative uh, uh, easing, for example. And I use that as an, as an example. Well, actually, if I look at Germany, as, as Desmond showed, up, showed us before, uh, monetary conditions, if anything, should be slightly tightened uh, today. If I were just formulating position for Germany, I would slightly tighten conditions, pretty much like what the ECB, what the ECB did recently. If I were looking at, at Italy, then the ECB should have been massively easing uh, monetary conditions. Now, a well-functioning monetary union would have a central bank that would actually be designing policy in the interest of the euro area as a whole. But in this case, we see that, that the ECB has tightened policy and has kept policy much tighter than is necessary for the euro area as a whole. So this is the sense in which European institutions are not functioning in a symmetric way. Had the ECB been functioning in a symmetric way and had the fiscal policy been better, we would have had a fiscal monetary policy mix that would have been more encouraging of growth in Italy without violating any of the, uh, any of the rules. If the ECB was uh, running policy uh, delivering 2% inflation for the euro area instead of 1%, that alone would have created a, uh, a much better nominal income growth in Italy, a much lower unemployment in Italy, but it would also have meant if you want to have a 2% average inflation for the euro area, it would have meant that the inflation rate, say, in Germany would have been 3%. So if the ECB is operating as if inflation in Germany should be under 2% rather than care for the euro area as a whole, then you are going to get unbalanced results, such as the results that we have been getting. Thank you. I think our next question was here. Wait for the microphone, please. It's the lady right here, please. It's right uh, behind your right shoulder. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Teresa Terminacian, formerly from the IMF, actually, his predecessor. <laughs> um, I have two, two questions. One is for Vitor. And basically, do I read uh, your uh, presentation as uh, saying that uh, if there is a crisis in Europe, the political will will emerge to find new mechanisms or strengthen the existing mechanisms so that there isn't a collapse. But if there isn't a crisis, probably the politics will not make for any major changes in the foreseeable future. So that's one question. The other question is for, for Desmond. Um, I was a little bit uh, uh, puzzled by the fact that uh, um, you know, your charts showed that Italy actually had a substantial recovery of investment over the last uh, few years. And also the fact that, uh, uh, according to Lorenzo, and I mean, it's a fact, uh, you know, export performance in Italy has been better than in many other uh, European countries. This sort of conflicts a bit with your picture of, you know, uh, Italy being sort of a basket case in terms of competitiveness. How, how do you explain that? Okay, thank you. and, and uh... Let's take the first question first. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, yes. So if there is a crisis, I think it's clear from the way uh, Europe uh, responded to the global financial crisis in 2008 in the context of the G20 and in, with the uh, European uh, Economic Recovery Plan and then uh, the way it reacted later on, uh, the crisis, uh, when it became specifically uh, European, the uh, European uh, sovereign debt and banking crisis, with uh, effective action, of which I failed to uh, mention the whatever uh, it takes of uh, uh, Mario Draghi and the massive impact that that particular act by the president of DCP had on expectations, but I could continue. So when there is a crisis and the crisis is bad enough, up to now, in all the years of history of European integration, the revealed political preference of Europeans has been to respond to the crisis and move forward. 
politics as usual have become more, more difficult. So the, fragment, the political fragmentation that Desmond and I spoke about mean that deals in the European Parliament will be more difficult and it means that, the, that there is also a fragmentation of poles of power between the European Commission, the future European Commission, the uh, European Council and the European Parliament. So uh, politics, normal politics, uh, say politics of the day to day will become uh, more difficult and I would not be very optimistic about the pace of progress under uh, that scenario. Thank you, Desmond. You want to talk about Italian investment and exports? Yeah. Uh, my chart showed that you know, there was something like a 30% loss of competitiveness over the past uh, 20 years. And it also showed that Italy's per capita income had gone down, whereas others uh, had gone up. I didn't have a chart on uh, investment. You know, I, I don't see that. I don't think that was my chart. It yeah. was a green line, yeah, I one. remember. It, it, Maybe oh, you can come oh, up. Okay, okay. It, it was just but, no, that's, sure, that's just no, like no, a two year period. After 2014. No, 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 that's the chart, the, that, that would correct it. That's why I'm having difficulty. Is that chart, uh, I mean, I can bring it back up, but it was after it, what that chart was intended to show is what happened to UK investment after June 2016. So we're really just talking about a very short period. There are many ways in which you, know, you can you get a cyclical recovery in the one place, you don't get a cyclical recovery in the other. Uh, you know, that I'm sure that if you looked at Italy over a longer period of time, if you looked at over the 20 years that I'm talking about where its per capita income is going down, uh, its investment must have uh, lagged. And that is basically the point I'm making, is that if you continually lose uh, competitiveness, you're not going to be a reasonable location uh, where people are going to want to invest. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take this question back here, please. Thank you. Um, I shall stand up because this uh, gets me very impassioned. Um, I have a couple of things I will say, um, but Before it relates you to my start, question. Uh, um, would you give us your name and affiliation? Sure. Um, Peter from uh, the country formerly known as the United Kingdom. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully not. But, um, yeah, I, have, um, I, I, I took part in the, uh, in the Remain marches that, uh, that took place. I flew back missing school because uh, I just graduated from SAIS because I feel so strongly about it. So being a Brit, I probably have a bit of hopeless optimism as much as also a degree of realism. But... Um, uh, Farage, with his uh, with his Brexit party, they they acquired collectively around thirty nine percent. However, Liberal Democrats, the Greens, those who rem the Remain side of Labour, Labour is an issue in itself, um, and Change UK actually acquired around forty four percent of overall like Brexit voting patterns in the EU parliamentary elections. Therefore, basically emphasising that as much as there is, you know, this desire to leave Europe, there is also a really strong still desire to remain. Mm -hmm. And the only clear correlation or causation we can find is polarization is, 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 is systemic. Um, I have to ask you to come to your question. Okay, my question is basically, all of this comes back down to the communication, I think, between the elites, which much of us have been talking about, and those who actually most affected the people. What is it that, is gonna, that has to change, that is necessary within the EU system, uh, to get that to occur, because I think the EU project could survive if that happens. Okay, what is it that has to change for the communication between the, yeah. the peoples no, I, and the elites? I think that the facts that you're stating are correct, that Nigel Farage only got 35% and the Remain crowd you know, got more votes, but I don't know whether that is relevant to uh, the dynamics that is going on right now or the kind of legal framework within which we're operating. You're going to be left between now and October the 31st with the same parliamentary composition as you had before this latest vote. That's not going to change at all. And you're going to have a prime minister who is going to be uh, very much a hard Brexiter. You've got an October 31 deadline. You know, that it's not the, in order for the United Kingdom not to crash out you'd have to have the Prime Minister 
asking either for an extension or he's got to lose his position in a vote of confidence, you go to an election. But if you get a prime minister who says that come October 31st, we're going to leave with or without a deal, uh, you know, unless Parliament, the current composition of Parliament stops him, uh, that is going to occur. You're going to have a uh, hard Brexit. So what I'm saying is that the latest election, the European parliamentary election, might have been indicative of what the public sentiment is, but what really counts is what goes on in Westminster, what goes on with the new prime minister, and you've got this October 31 uh, deadline. And the default position is if you don't have an agreement by October 31st, or you don't ask for a, uh, an extension, you crash out. May I? That's a... I'm sorry. Uh, this, so will be our, this will be our last uh, comment. I think your question four. is really hard. That is, when you have a situation where there is a correlation, as Guizzo and co-authors have shown, between uh, the rise of populism and perceptions of economic and financial insecurity, uh, perceptions that uh, key issues not appropriately addressed are like migration or terrorism, you have, in a sense, a environment where people want to feel safe. They want these people that are want to feel safe. They want to be protected. There is a bit of a politics of fear. Now, when that is relevant in a political dialogue, having a rational exchange of arguments is hard. So targeting uh, communication in the sense that you were expressing communication is a very, very hard task. You have a lot of emotions going on. And we, economists, I particularly, I'm ill-equipped to think about environments where our models of rational behavior have trouble coping with what is going on. I'm not, I'm not making a normative statement. The only normative statement that I'm making is about myself. I should have better models. <laughs> uh, but I've been trained to use this, and so I'm at a disadvantage. But look at what polarization did to the UK political system. Clearly, having a split almost at the middle of society is something that a political system finds very hard to cope with. And it tries to adapt. And there is a tremendous amount of instability. The relative weight of parties changes dramatically. There is a party that crashes down and another one that shoots up because Farage has changed parties. Uh, look, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I think that uh, note gives us a good, uh, good lot to think about. Uh, as we end, the optimist. we are uh, <laughs> and that from the optimist. Yes, thank you. We are, uh, our time is up, unfortunately. I'm sure if you have further questions or comments, the panelists will be glad to speak informally afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. And let's show our appreciation for a great panel.